Well, good evening to our viewers in Germany and hello to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's conversation. President Joe Biden entered office last January with a commitment to revive and revitalize relations with allies and partners. And this gave tremendous hope to the transatlantic community. Over the past year, there have been some positive developments such as the US rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, the resolution of bilateral trade disputes and the launch of a new technology and trade initiative. But there have also been some irritants to the transatlantic partnership such as the hasty military withdrawal from Afghanistan, the AUKUS submarine deal, and divisions over how to handle relations with China. From the pandemic to climate change to concerns over Russia and China, the United States and Europe face a host of common challenges that are best addressed together. However, some Europeans worry that the United States might not be a reliable partner. And some Americans are currently wondering the same about Germany. Today, we're joined by the heads of two uh, of, of Germany's two leading foreign policy think tanks to try to talk about the state of the transatlantic relationship one year into the Biden administration. Catherine Kluva Ashbrook is the director and CEO of the German Council on Foreign Relations, or DGAP, in Berlin. Catherine, it is great to see you, and I want to thank you for joining us despite your massive cold. Thank you, Steve. I'll do my best not to sound too francophone and nasal, um, but we'll power through. And I'm really just glad to be in this conversation with all of you. Well, you sound great. And, and I really appreciate your, your taking the time to join us. We're also joined by Dr. Stefan Maya. He's, he has served as the director of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs and also as the executive chairman of the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, or SWP, since October of 2020. And Stefan, it is great to see you again. Herzlich willkommen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. So both bios will be posted to the chat so that we can dive right into our conversation. Um, and I, I thought you know, maybe we could start by just getting your reactions to Secretary Antony Blinken's visit to Berlin last week and to the public speech that he made. Um, Catherine, I, I think you were actually in the room when Biden made, uh, when Blinken made his remarks. And so I thought maybe we could, we could start by getting your reaction to what he said and how it resonated with, with those that were actually there. Well, that's, I think, two really interesting points right there. Um, look, the secretary had been, I think, admirably briefed by Karen Donfried, our former colleague uh, and head of the German Marshall Fund, uh, who has now gone on to become a senior advisor on Europe uh, to this president and the secretary of state. Uh, what we heard there, and indeed, Steve, you are right, I was in the room, an event co-hosted by all the transatlanticist organizations uh, in Berlin and ACG from afar uh, in Washington. So congratulations on that. Um, we heard the Secretary of State deliver what in colloquial American English we might consider a rap sheet of what Russia has perpetrated, if you will, uh, against the international community, not specifically the United States, but in terms of treaty violations from sort of its overstepping of the Helsinki uh, Accords from 75, uh, violations of the Bucharest Treaty and so on and so forth, a long laundry list from the US Secretary of State geared squarely at the German public. Because as you noted in your opening statement, what the Americans are now seeing is that the disunity of pronouncements in terms of what might be in a diplomatic package that is leveraged into the conversation with Russia to de-escalate the situation on the Ukrainian border does not come off as cohesive uh, from this coalition government and thus in conversations all over Europe. So uh, it was critical from the American assessment to launch into this with a piece of public diplomacy. It is American forte to shroud uh, possible big actions uh, in a public diplomacy discourse. And that was certainly the intention. Now, did it reach the German public? Well, no, for two reasons, or maybe three reasons. 
Um, one, uh, we were very few people in the room and we were already the converted. Secondly, uh, this was a speech not delivered in any way uh, during prime time, but in the middle of the afternoon that has a scheduling component to it. So fair enough, let's take the logistics away. But that same evening, I was commenting on it on German news and it made the, the shortest clips of this speech made it into German evening news and a German population that's largely skews older uh, is a very um, loyal demographic to their evening news. So will not have gotten the actual message uh, as it was delivered, at least not from the evening news. Uh, and that on the backdrop, and I'll wrap here, Steve, uh, of, a, of a public in this country that's not entirely sure what the various different levers that are being discussed, sanctions packaged to include SWIFT, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, non-operational, quote unquote, um, and then, you know, potential lethal aid to Ukraine would actually do to get Russia to back down. This is not my view. This is not my opinion, but that's part and parcel of German public opinion. It's all wrapped up with a specific German view of Russia, which we'll get into, I'm sure, later into the conversation. But all of which to say is the secretary came with a message to deliver. Did it land? No, it did not. Must it land? Yes, it must. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, you're smiling. Um, it looks like you might have something to say. And I, I want to ask you sort of the same question of, of whether you share Catherine's um, interpretation that, uh, that the secretary's uh, case did not land or, or whether, um, whether sort of the, the policy elites in Berlin at least heard something, even if the general public um, did not get the full message. I think the focus of the media, media coverage was different. Uh, certainly it reached me, I was not in the room, Catherine, and, <laughs> and uh, the, the public diplomacy efforts um, he made uh, reached me. But you are right. I think it was less about the Blinken speech. I think uh, the media coverage we have is more about the splits in our own coalition government, different position taken by the foreign minister, by the, uh, by the chancellor, also the debate we have within the Social Democratic Party about how to deal with Russia. Um, so I think it was quite, quite difficult for him to make the point, as I said. The media coverage was more, fo more focused on internal coalition dynamics uh, than on the transatlantic uh, field. And, and this is, I think, also the main issue we have to discuss in Germany. We have to uh, define our position on Russia. Uh, I think there is some movement and some, some dynamics are already there. Um, uh, I see also a more controversial debate within the Social Democratic Party about what position to take. Um, and here, certainly also the Blinken visit, more the visit than the speech, had, I think has some effects on, 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 on the German debate, uh, on the debate we have in Berlin. Um, but as I said, the focus was different. And perhaps he or we expected too much as a, as a public diplomacy signal to the German um, um, people, to the German public. I, I think, you know, both of you have touched on a, on a couple of subjects that I think um, are, are really important for us as, as transatlanticists um, and certainly for us as, as Germany watchers of exactly what's going on in this new coalition government. Um, as I mentioned uh, on, a, on a call this morning, you know, I think many people were concerned that, that Olaf Scholz's biggest challenge would be to keep the three coalition parties aligned. Um, and now we're not only seeing divisions between the parties, but within those parties and how that unfolds uh, really remains to be seen, both in terms of domestic politics in Germany, but also in terms of Germany's foreign policy. Um, but we're here today to, to talk a, you know, a little bit more about an assessment of the Biden administration from, from Berlin and the state of the transatlantic relationship. And unfortunately, it looks as if the concerns over Russia and Ukraine might be pushing the US and Germany apart rather than together. Um, throughout this crisis, uh, many Europeans have expressed some concerns about not being at the table for talks with Russia about Ukraine. And so I'm curious whether, whether the perception in Berlin is that it looks like the US is, is going it alone and, and not collaborating well with EU allies or if Blinken's visit might have helped allay some of those concerns. I'll let you go first. I'm happy to follow up. I, I, I still, I think the basic perception is Berlin and probably also in other European capitals uh, that 
of course, we would have preferred to have a sit, seat at the table and to discuss together with Putin and Biden uh, what the new European security architecture would be about. But on the other hand, I think we all know that uh, what we would bring to the table is quite limited. Uh, what can we offer there? Um, uh, it's very much about um, uh, a military threat and how to counter the military threat. Um, the European capabilities to do so, as I said, are quite limited. Uh, so the only thing what we could really offer is kind of economic pressure, economic sanctions, coercion. Here a little bit, I'm a little bit more positive than I would have been three or four weeks ago. But when I look at that discussion we have in Berlin, I think there is now not a consensus, but we are getting closer to this, that we have really to take tougher economic measures, uh, even talk about Nord Stream 2, even talk about SWIFT. This is changing. Uh, slowly, but it's changing. Um, but as I said, what we have to offer in military terms is quite limited. The, the German position is even more complicated, uh, as you know, and complex about this, uh, uh, even um, refusing um, not only to deliver arms by ourselves, but also stopping others from uh, delivering arms, mm -hmm. which have some German components uh, or have a German history somehow. Um, so, but I'm a little bit more positive that we are at least closely getting a consensus on this in Germany. Well, I think <clears throat> there was a public perception on this and then there was the actual uh, reality of coordination. So your question, Steve, I cannot tell you how many times the German and European press asked me that about two weeks ago to say, we, you know, we Europeans need to have a seat at the table, but I completely agree with Stefan. What would we have added to that table? Vladimir Putin did not want to talk to us. If he'd wanted to talk to us, he would have, right? Um, he would have made that clear. He would have said, let's Normandy format all the way. Let's pick up on Minsk too. I mean, this is the other point that Secretary Blinken made. If this were an honest offer to have a real in-depth discussion about the security architecture in Europe, those are diplomatic <clears throat> conversations to be had, even on the list of, of, well, not on all of them, but the list of the points that the Russians put forward and or on the future of Crimea, you know, how we actually resolve the issues on the table. And there's, you know, very concrete ones, part of Minsk too. If that were really at stake, that would be a different story. That is not what's at stake, as we all know, I think, and have come to understand very clearly. This is about Vladimir Putin being seen, being heard, and being taken seriously in the great power competition game that's currently underway. Uh, he wants to make sure that the United States does not, quote unquote, get distracted by China, but continue to see both, you know, the Russian Federation uh, and then particularly the Russian Federation, possibly uh, in combination or at least in coordination uh, with the Chinese leadership as formidable threats and formidable powers to be reckoned with. And in that regard, you know, the diplomacy that we're now seeing much more openly in terms of the shuttle diplomacy, because we see all the European foreign ministers flying around the continent, Blinken coming over and sort of a set of unplanned visits, uh, the CIA briefing that um, William Burns, uh, Bill Burns delivered to the German chancellor. The, we're seeing a little bit more of how the sausage gets made, but that sausage was getting made all along. So with mm -hmm. the German press asking me that, fair enough. But it's not to say that th these things weren't coordinated. They were coordinated very closely. We also see a continued, um, you know, despite the fact that we are seeing these um, cleavages among uh, the, the German uh, political elite, we see continued efforts by the Americans to keep the Germans close. Why? For the same reason that you just mentioned, is, or and Stefan noted also, the minute we go into a sanctions package or have to go into a sanctions package, who will suffer most? German business, German enterprise. And that's why you have these odd pronouncements. I mean, odd in the sense of revealing diplomatic tactic, probably realistic in terms of just underscoring reality. Swift, it, putting Swift on the table will be of enormous, uh, um, you know, consequence for German, for German business, without a doubt. But diplomatically, it's not smart to take that tool off the table um, you know, as, as early as now, effectively, before mm -hmm. uh, an invasion has happened. So it's, it's an odd schizophrenic situation, but because you have different parts of the German public pronouncing, I mean, sorry, the German political elite pronouncing different things at different times, including the opposition, um, as late as uh, the Sunday talk show or circuit that, um, that Marco Zuda uh, leaned into, it gives and offers a very, very disjointed uh, picture when Biden has continued 
continued to basically uh, cover the German uh, government on Nord Stream vis-a-vis the Republican critics and some of the Democratic critics at home, rightly, and tried to create as much birth of action uh, for the Germans. So for the Germans then to be falling apart in all sorts of different ways and not being able to hold a unitary line seems to make Germany look like the Achilles heel in the Western negotiation with Russia. May, may, may I add on this, Steve? Perhaps, uh, Absolutely. Because I think it's not only the, the concerns about uh, what the economic effects on German business might be or uh, what uh, but we think about uh, uh, these sanctions. It might also be what the economic effects of sanctions might be on Russia. Uh, and, uh, and, and here, of course, uh, if there is a deep economic crisis in, the, in in Russia, it will have destabilizing effects on, on the country, uh, on the regime. And uh, this, I think, is also of some concern uh, to Germany. Russia is an immediate neighborhood, so to speak. Um, we have already some neighboring countries which uh, are deeply destabilized. And the destabilizing Russia is beyond the issue of, um, of uh, immediate economic uh, consequences for German business. I think also a very big concern uh, uh, to German and to German de- de- uh, decision makers. I mean, certainly here in the U.S., I think um, the the real concern and criticism is, as as you've both alluded to, and, and Catherine, as you said outright, sort of taking some of the leverage off the table um, as as early as we are, um, because it really feels as if we have very little leverage um, and saying that SWIFT is not going to uh, come into play, that Nord Stream 2 is is not going to be um, used in a tool, uh, used as a tool in all of this, uh, makes it very difficult to know sort of where do we go from here. And so it's, it's good to hear that that debate is still evolving um, in in Germany, uh, we've gotten a couple of viewer questions that that tie into to this, and I'd like to to pose some of them. Um, we were talking initially about this this issue of of having a place at the table, and um, one of our our viewers says one sometimes has to earn that place at the table, and expresses some frustration at um, Germany's um, not allowing. Estonia to ship some artillery pieces to Ukraine. Um, what's the explanation for that? Why why won't Germany do that? Is it as simple as um, there are some some German um, components uh, in in the artillery, or is it is it more the principle of it? Uh, if I may start, uh, Catherine, uh, uh, no, arms exports is a very sensitive issue to the present coalition agreement. You know, um, coalition, when you look at the agreement, uh, they are even talking about uh, to make our arms con- uh, control export regime even more st- even stricter than it already is. And we have, uh, of course, um, uh, this uh, um, our history, which at least seems to convince the Green Party and big parts of the Social Democratic Party, that we shouldn't engage in this. And, um, we have uh, every year big debate about when we take the fifth or sixth rent uh, in international arm, exp- uh, arm exports. So I think this, it's a big sensitive issue. And uh, you have to see it uh, uh, behind this background, uh, before this background, and, uh, and to judge this on, 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 on yeah, and the sensitivity we certainly have there. But on the other hand, uh, we have also the other uh, strain of discussion, uh, which we used, if you remember, uh, debate very much at the Kosovo crisis, uh, that um, it's not only a German responsibility um, to prevent Europe from, not, from having another war, uh, also mm-hmm. Auschwitz remains um, means some responsibility and that we have to uh, stick close to our values and to protect some values and some, uh, some norms. So I see this debate also emerging with regards to arms exports um, um, uh, to grain. Uh, it's starting slowly, but I think it's, it's coming up and uh, it will certainly have some influence on our um, discussions. I mean, the bizarre reality is, of course, that there's nothing really, I mean, aside from agreements, as Stefan points out, sort of in the basic law or any other sort of um, legal prescript that might prevent this. This is a really a, a moralistic understanding. I mean, we've had very controversial, just at the end of the Merkel administration, in fact, 
German weapons mm-hmm. exports were as high as they ever were historically. And they went to some very questionable countries, countries that, you know, by extension are engaged in, in military um, conflicts in Yemen and elsewhere. So if it's just about having German armory writ large in an area of conflict, that argument begins to be difficult to hold. Now, to be fair, in Ukraine um, or on the Estonia piece, we're talking, of course, about areas on which uh, Germany unrolled the most cataclysmic, uh, um, you know, destruction uh, mm-hmm. since the history of mankind. So there's that piece. Um, but what Stefan is alluding to, and I think this is what makes this difficult, we Germans have a tendency to think that these kind of debates, these long moral and philosoph- philosoph- philosophical debates, which are, are a key part of our, our, the, the way that we evolve genetically as, as a modern nation, can be had on our own time. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is the main problem right now. Yes, we have to have all these conversations. In theory, we should have had had them consistently since Kosovo. And I think Stefan is exactly right. I mean, that's, you know, there have been many a paper written about the salami tactic employed by Volker Rühe and how Fischer won the Green Party over to get, you know, and how we changed the constitution uh, in the early 90s to deploy out of area. And those were all lot, you know, but this, that all happened under a very functional security umbrella. And since we're here to discuss Joe Biden's presidency, let me just say one word. And I made this point in an op-ed that I wrote in German, but for Die Welt last week, which is to say, we don't have that time. It can very well be, if you look at the crisis of democracy, as I perceive it in the United States, as, as half an American or as uh, with my American half, if this democracy crisis is real and as sustained as it seems, and we might have a presidential election in 2024 that is not entirely cleanly democratic in the way that we would see it, and we have a president that is elected fully emboldened by a non-democratic electoral pursuit, uh, and then the legal uh, aspects that will follow, and we see an American retrenchment that is is not only because then we begin to, you know, I mean, civil war is perhaps further in the offing, but you know, where an America needs to focus needs needs to focus on itself in a way that would be the best case scenario. Um, then we have a whole other problem, and I mean, if if to to spin that one row further. If the, if the Washington Treaty or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization holds in the preamble that all members have to be democracies and America has slipped to being in a liberal democracy, the security umbrella that has sustained Germany's economic prosperity and security over the 70, last 70 years might fold. And not in the distinct, you know, never, never lands that would allow for us to have this moralistic debate that Stefan alludes to that we would be exceptionally good at. Um, but in the very, very near future, I'm talking about the next 24 months to three years. Uh, and if, in fact, we see military engagement uh, at the border or an incursion or some version where this plays out even worse and Putin feels emboldened and begins moving on NATO allies, we have a serious, serious time bound problem on our hands that our German public and our German political elite is insufficiently geared up for because the fact mm-hmm. that we, immediately go back to this muscle of having these conversations as if we had the luxury of time, in my mind, defies the political realities on the ground. Yeah, I mean, Catherine, I think you and I are, are on the same page um, on the fact that the, the window is closing rapidly um, and that these conversations need to be need to be had now. Um, and I'd like to come back to that and, and to the Biden presidency in just a second. But, but first, I'd like to ask Stefan, um, a question because the the EU foreign ministers, of course, are, are meeting today. Um, top of the agenda is um, is Russia and the situation on the border with Ukraine. And one of our viewers is curious how unified um, the EU actually is, um, and what would happen if the U.S. were to step back and simply support whatever position. Um, the EU or the European NATO members would take in this crisis? I think at at first sight, they certainly are not unified. Uh, We have very different positions with regard to Ukraine and and Russia within the European Union membership. Uh, We know that uh, the Baltic states 
and uh, our eastern neighbors, uh, Poland, especially uh, taking a, uh, a stance which is very close to the American stance. Um, the French position is different from, from that. So they haven't heard that much about the Spanish and the Haley position on, on that. But on the other hand, I wouldn't also underestimate uh, the ability of the European Union uh, to reach at a consensus. Uh, when you look at the economic sanctions at the past, which we took after the annexation of the Crimea and we took about uh, after the incursions in the Eastern Ukraine, we have taken this as a whole, as a European Union. We have renewed the sanctions year by year after some discussions, but at least we, we had um, uh, achieved um, uh, this, uh, this consensus. So I think, and this is certainly a phenomenon uh, which uh, is at the heart of the European Union. We will have different positions, quite lively discussions on which the consensus should be about, but we will also be able at the end to reach a consensus. So, mm -hmm. Certainly not on the toughest measures, that, that might well be, but uh, the, at the end, there will be a European position. I'm quite, quite confident about that. We could certainly spend um, the entire hour talking about the, the current crisis, but I'd like to take a, a step back from the current crisis, which I know is, is hard to do, um, and, and come back to sort of the Biden administration and, and where things are going and, and the state of the relationship, um, because there are a number of other issues on the table as well. Catherine, Biden made a lot of initial overtures to Europe about America being back and about wanting to work more closely again with European partners, um, particularly in Berlin, but elsewhere in Europe. Do Europeans actually see that there has been significant action behind those, those words, um, or was it just a change in, in tone and tenor? Well, up to a point, and I'm, frankly, the, the change in tone and tenor made many politicians across Europe sleep well uh, at night for another, you know, for a couple of months, certainly into the beginning of this presidency. And after four years of not knowing what was going to happen at any odd hour of the night with the previous president sleeping, whatever it was, three hours a night and tweeting furiously and calling up Fox News and you know, making decisions beyond and against the advice of his policy advisors and speaking to shady characters, uh, on on um, Europe's uh, eastern flank, <laughs> I think, you know, that in a way already helped. And then the fact that this president came out with a number of like very concrete offers um, down to the, you know, meeting with uh, Chancellor Merkel in July that could have been a very happy diplomatic, um, you know, ceremony without much other uh, repercussions um, that, you know, spurred on the beginning of the, the, the Trade and Tech Council, as you already mentioned, then there were two very concrete uh, proposals made within it, a futures forum, a German American futures forum, uh, and then some work on climate and energy that I think this new government is trying to fill, you know, with, with, with the appropriate speed, even though they, they too are just getting up to speed. But then, of course, and I mean, we don't need to belabor that, were the, were the sort of things that were perceived as almost schizophrenic actions uh, here. And we've already, you've already noted Afghanistan. And then, of course, the AUKUS piece, even though, uh, of course, um, the Germans were less affected by the AUKUS decision, but certainly, you know, in complete ignorance of what uh, French diplomatic protocol, French sensitivities, French economic realities uh, would be affected by that decision seem to indicate that try as it might, and even with an understanding of American potential declinism or real, real competition with China, America just cannot shake its hegemonial approach. And that came mm -hmm. out in small nuances as well when the Secretary of Defense uh, you know, went to the UK and basically gave Boris Johnson the advice that uh, they shouldn't, in fact, push so much on Indo-Pacific that that was the American terrain. And if anything, they should fall in line with the Americans. These sort of more prescriptive, uh, that sort of more prescriptive tone and tenor that started to creep in over the last couple of months seemed to indicate to the Europeans that, in fact, what people had hoped and people like Madeleine Albright and others on the American side said, oh, you know, we're now truly, um, uh, you know, equal partners and eye to eye in part because our power and capacity has diminished. Uh, 
Mm, not exactly true. The Americans have a very specific agenda when it comes to Indo-Pacific. They have a very specific agenda when it comes to China, and they much rather the Europeans just fall in line. And so, uh, in as much as the Europeans won't are, are not able and don't want to do that, again, you you know have these sort of odd moments. And to be fair, you said earlier, you know, the trade issues are are, are done with. They're not. I mean, there's <laughs> many of these issues are solved with these sort of awkward. Um, halfway house compromise structures that don't really make the Europeans all that happy. The United States stayed, stayed shut down to a German and, and European business interests for far too long, if you ask any European, uh, and in a way that wasn't entirely comprehensible, even given pandemic conditions. So in as much as you know, the early gestures made European policy elites sleep better at night, the realities have been much more hiccupy, much more real, much more unhappy, uh, so that you know certain parts of this community really aren't very satisfied with the Biden administration. Uh, you know, with what the Biden administration is sending across the Atlantic, and sort of some some hiccups that one would not have expected from someone as, as experienced as as the president, but also a team that's as experienced as as his team is. I think that that's one of the other concerns that that I've heard as well. Um, Stefan, toward the end of what what Catherine was talking about, she um, mentioned trade, and I, I did have a, a question that I wanted to ask you about that. Um, because of course, you know, some key bilateral trade disputes um, were resolved in the last year. Um, but I think there have, has continued to be some tension um, in the trade area between Europe and the U.S., and particularly between Germany and the U.S. And you know, I guess one question that a lot of people have is, is whether there's any progress on, on developing new trade agreements um, between Europe and the United States, and whether you see any potential for those developing or, or taking hold in the months ahead, because as we talked about earlier, there's not a lot of time before the midterms, and it might be even more difficult to get something passed um, after that. No, I don't see really any major trade agreement on the table, uh, less because of, of, of the United States, more about the, uh, the Europeans. So when you look at the, the more recent um, um, FTAs we have negotiated, we haven't hardly ratified any, any of those. Uh, there's a strong resistance in the European public about uh, against further trade agreements. Uh, and if we are in favor of trade agreements, then with a very strong component element with regard to sustainability and, uh, and, and, and social and labor standards. So I think it's very difficult for me to imagine that we get any any major trade agreement ratified in the, in the, in the near future. And this might make it quite difficult or even impossible, impossible to negotiate a trade agreement with the Americans. But on the other hand, I think we have a lot to discuss about technological standard setting. There we might see some achievements and some progress within the Trade and Technology Council. I think this is the emphasis in the priority I would define. Let's talk about international standard setting. Let's try to agree on certain technological standards across the Atlantic and then hope that we really get this also on an international level. I think this is one of the major issues we have to talk about. And this is also, the, from my point of view, one of the main fields uh, we have to deal with the Chinese. Uh, we, have, we have to counter Chinese influence. Perhaps even more important than than a trade agreement. So we, have, as I had my former job, we tried to calculate what the immediate economic effect would be of a, a far-reaching, comprehensive trade agreement, and it was quite quite limited uh, because both markets are fairly open to each other. Um, uh, of course, we have some disputes, but as I said, I think the more immediate and more important issues to is to get, get agreements on the on standard setting and the technological fit. So Stefan, you, you've started to describe um, sort of some of the low hanging fruit of, of where the US and Europe could be working together more closely and, and where Germany could play an important role. And I guess um, I'd be interested in hearing from both of you about what, what opportunities might have been missed during Biden's first year in office um, that could still be addressed now um, things like standard setting um, and and advancements in, in joint technology um, initiatives uh, 
is obviously one important area, but are there other areas where you think um, we really missed the boat and, and should revisit it in the months ahead? Catherine, you're nodding. Yeah, it's, I mean, <clears throat> so much in the China portfolio, I think could, or in what we might earmark as the China portfolio, and Stefan's point is absolutely accurate, even the standard setting piece is something in the China portfolio, but it preys into this idea that, again, we have to prove to our societies that democracies, because of their pluralism, openness, innovative capacity, uh, immigrant um, histories, et cetera, et cetera, are capable of producing value, economic and socio socioeconomic, uh, in a way that uh, China is not. And in the standard setting, that sounds uh, boring at first, but th that that was a place where we really missed the boat, where, stand where uh, China and Russia uh, really moved in when it came to ICT technology standards, I mean, telecommunications regulators, um, where the minute the Chinese or Russians saw a, a, a vacancy, moved their personnel in, in a way that makes us as the West look like we were completely asleep at the wheel. So to rein that back in, um, and also, you know, praise on all the security components around 5G, 6G. We have a NATO strategic concept coming up in um, June where, you know, they're, they're debating in the back end whether something like clean networks could be something that's part of the 2% goal, uh, which is to say we will keep Chinese providers out of European networks because they're going to be quintessential to security networks. So that's one thing where I think you need to really be pushing. But then other components. So, um, you know, there was a lot of concern that the, the democracy summit would sort of be this little blip on the radar, radar and then not go further. But at the end of that, they did uh, agree a number of European countries, not Germany, but a number of European countries in the United States on export control, joint export control mechanism to countries um, with human rights violations, obviously with specific view to China in mind, that could be something that I think would be pretty low cost uh, fruit for this German coalition government to uh, come into precisely because they have put on their many map of many strategies of which they have many, uh, th that a China strategy is forthcoming. And the same thing is true when it comes to market access issues, when it comes to IP protection, again, these all sound terribly technical. And I understand, you know, to an amateur lay audience at home, they'd say like, well, where's the, you know, where's the beef in that? And yet in this day and age where we're so codependent, um, you know, where interdependence has moved on almost to codependency, um, these are the kind of things that matter. Technology matters, speed matters, access matters. Um, so if we get that, that right, uh, there's a lot to be had for our economies. To Stefan's very good point, measurable, measurably to be had without necessarily having to build an entire container, uh, container FDA type structure around it. But the most important thing is that on all these issues, we can continue the conversation. We don't out of issues of impatience or uncoordination or lack of understanding of the other sides, uh, go back to, you know, quote unquote, not checking in with one another often enough. So in that sense, I do think that that's almost been the greatest contribution of this administration to just um, be very proactive, really try to reach out, um, you know, steer the bench or make the bench on European experts very deep, both at the NSC and the White House. And so there, you know, I, I personally think a lot of these conversations need to be had at a much higher strategic level uh, and should be coordinated in that way, but maybe we won't get there. But the most important thing is that on all these issues, we keep talking and we develop together what that low hanging fruit might be. So it's not prescriptive in either direction. May I briefly add on this, Steve, because uh, Catherine, I think, really covered all the, all the, all the major issues. I would like to, to add some, just one. I think we should have better coordinated our efforts to fight the pandemic um, internationally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is really a low-hanging fruit we missed. Um, instead, we, we got caught in a controversy about forced licensing of patents uh, and, uh, and really lost uh, out of sight what we could do more um, and, and coordinate our efforts better with regard uh, to WHO, with regard uh, to our international um, uh, efforts to fight the pandemic. So that, that would have been another low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. So, so Stefan, let me actually ask you a follow-up question that, that comes from one of our viewers. And it's a point that both of you have touched on, which is 
um, this issue of, of setting standards and norms. Um, the, the viewer recognizes that it's a, a great point to, to focus on this and that you know, this, this effort comes at a time when international institutions are under strain because of everything else is going on in, in the world. So how could we better jointly um, approach standard, standard setting through the, the transatlantic alliance. Um, how could Europe and the US work more closely together? Stefan, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I, I think certainly the format we have to use is this uh, Trade and Technology Council. Uh, I think we, the, the main challenge we certainly have is that we to, have two different approaches with regard to standard setting. In America, it's very much determined by market forces, uh, very much uh, relies on, um, uh, on, on, on business, uh, very much, um, as I said, refers to market forces. Here in Europe, we have usually a top-down approach in standard setting. It's the European Commission, which uh, defines the framework, then it's on the, the national governments uh, to fill in. Of course, we have some uh, a role to play also by the private sector, but we have very two different approaches with regard to standard setting. So we need this format of the Trade and Technology Council to uh, align on, on, on these issues and, and to find their common ground with regard to some standards. Um, so I, I would have really loved to see the Trade Technology Council more active um, and, and more concrete and precise in the work it does. Both of you have, have talked a little bit about um, the, the, or Stefan brought it up and, and Catherine, you were nodding about the, the way in which we could have joined forces to address the pandemic. Um, a little bit better. And it seems to me if you sort of compare Biden coming into office and now Olaf Scholz coming into office, um, the, the domestic politics and domestic concerns have really been at the top of the agenda, right? It's been pandemic response, dealing with the economic implications of that, looking at issues like energy, um, infrastructure, and you know, many of these issues, while they are national and local issues, also have global implications. And it would have been very nice to see greater collaboration between Washington and Berlin, or, or indeed across the Atlantic more broadly. Um, but one thing that's certainly been getting a lot of play here in the US has been Biden and his team talking about a foreign policy for the middle class and trying to sort of make Americans more aware of the rest of the world and how interconnected all of this is. Um, by addressing local issues and, and national issues, but also putting them in a more global context. Has this sort of sense, and, and Catherine, this is more of a question for you, has this concept of a, a foreign policy for the middle class resonated at all in Germany? Or, or have people in Germany, in Berlin, been watching um, what the Biden administration is trying to do in this regard? And are there any, any thoughts on that? Well, I really like your interpretation of a foreign policy for the middle <laughs> class, Steve, because um, it's read exactly the opposite way uh, in the political class here in Berlin, which is to say that by connecting foreign policy and domestic policy, that's a way for the Biden administration to say, listen, domestic policy is so much more important. And when it comes to you know, curtailing trade activities or really, you know, um, uh, I mean, you know, that's that's what the Germans have largely used to explain the fact that the resolution or the compromises in the trade disputes, be it steel, be it, you know, even Boeing and Airbus came a little late for a lot of people, um, that that's all bound up in the fact that he has to keep a domestic, he has to keep a country together. Mm -hmm. uh, he has to keep a party together. And he has to, you know, be signaling to the Republicans that there are ways in which he's still, quote unquote, perceived as tough. And that is, you know, and so the interpretation of, of foreign policy for the middle class is essentially diametrically opposed to how you just described it. But I do believe that the former is actually the intention of the American president. Mm -hmm. So right there, there's something that's sort of lost in translation because when I arrived here to take up my job in June and um, from the United States, uh, and we were getting ready for a German election campaign in which uh, you know, the uh, members of the Bundestag were about ready to um, take to the streets and for their, what we call Straßenwahlkampf, um, you know, that should have been in some regard, the exact model, which is how do you say, how do you bring 
uh, foreign policy into what is otherwise a very rich, happy, saturated uh, economy and country. And I think there could have been uh, a couple of things that they could have taken from the report that Jake Sullivan and others originally uh, authored for the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, there weren't. And so I think while it has become abundantly clear to both uh, sides of the Atlantic that uh, domestic policy, climate, energy, uh, pandemic management, you know, that there's, there are no clear lines anywhere and anymore between what might be considered domestic versus um, uh, international, we haven't quite wrapped our head around how we bring those two strands together in a functional way so that our citizens really understand it. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration, of course, has done something that's really interesting. I think this is what you're alluding to, is they took this plan and they took a lot of the big legislative initiatives that the president was planning and took it to the places where people still do trust, Americans still do trust their own government, and that place is in cities uh, and in their local environments. Um, by, I think, January, uh, or, or very early in the year, um, the president had met nine times since his election with uh, different groups of American mayors to you know, create among them an understanding, a desire to push through the big three legislative initiatives, uh, leaving aside the, um, the, the stimulus. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there was that commitment to try to explain what this president was all about and how this was going to pertain to the local level and really motivate the American economy to come rearing back. Um, that's not how it was read here. That's not how it's used here, sadly. Uh, so there, there certainly is, I think, a, a, a package of ideas that were fully lost in translation across the Atlantic. <laughs> yeah, but it, is it only lost in translation? Is it, uh, is it also very clear that the Biden... Uh, uh, it's not clear to me what really the Biden administration means by foreign policy for the middle class. Well, the interpretation you gave us, Steve, I think that would be very enjoy very much support in Europe as well, because we are also discussing how can we mobilize the necessary popular support for our foreign policy. But on the other hand, I think um, there are also some concerns that uh, foreign policy for the middle class is a hardly disguised attempt uh, to justify protectionist um, measures, uh, to justify unilateral decisions, or that. And uh, I think uh, and and we're we're not quite sure what what, what it means at the end, um, and uh, what interpretation is really the valid one given um, to it by the Biden administration. So it sounds like a lot more communication needs to to go on um, about this, both domestically but also internationally. Um, perhaps as a as a follow up question, one of our viewers writes: uh, In the fall of 2021, Richard Goen of the International Crisis Group said that President Biden needs to show that quote he's getting a grip on U.S. domestic politics. From Berlin, do you think President Biden has managed to do so? And how do you think his domestic focus has impacted his administration's foreign policy? That's a great array of questions. Um, the Germans are, you know, interesting critics of America. Uh, they owe so much to the United States and yet uh, they feel that it's they're in the first row and the first people who get to criticize uh, the way that America runs its domestic and foreign policy. I'm just literally quoting uh, what is sort of a genetic uh, component in German debate, uh, which is to say that around January 6th and also around the inauguration, German public television was full of. Uh, so the HBO documentary um, that Jamie, I think, Roberts uh, put together on January 6th, which I think is mandatory viewing for anybody who believes in democracy, you know, which effectively in the United States is on a pay-per-view channel, uh, ran in prime time uh, on German television, which is to say that they're very aware, German, even the general German public is very aware that the crisis of democracy is still exceptionally rife and that a year on, um, you know, we have nine, we have 39 lawsuits brought by 440 different legislators uh, in the United States and that there, there are big questions about whether the integrity of American democracy is actually has been held together by this president. And so um, they see on the one hand a need for this president to focus on domestic affairs and yet, 
Uh, they're beginning to understand just how dangerous a world they're confronted with. And what hasn't happened yet is how that's brought together. And so, as I argued in, in my op-ed, is now's the time not necessarily to push, not just to raise the European sovereignty flag as if that were some sort of panacea that's going to fix everything in X amount of time, because to achieve European sovereignty, uh, we're talking about amounts of taxpayer money and amounts of political capital that are almost beyond imagination if you were to try to do this in any sort of brevity of time. But to really understand that the Europeans have to get their house in order to save, and I'm not overstating this point, in part American democracy and American functionality because there remains to be, or there remains this, this interdependence that is vital for the functioning of the vet West and for the functioning of our, our very economic, um, economics and, and our societies. And I mean that, you know, if, if America as a model goes away, then it's then it's free hunting grounds for the rest mm-hmm. of the autocracies on the rest of Europe, and that that's a moment of danger. So that a Joe Biden deserves to be supported in any which way possible, not because he represents the Democratic Party capital D, but because he might be the last full stringent stronghold of American democracy, is something that yet has to settle into the German and European DNA. Now they're paying close attention, and they're concerned. But there's no real understanding of of what more Europeans could do, again, in the shortness of time that remains. And I think that, to me, as a German-American, frankly, is the most scary, scary reality at at this very moment. Mm -hmm. I think, Stefan, do you have anything to add? I'm I'm not so sure whether the concerns are really about the American model. It's more about the American capability and capacity to provide, still provide international public goods, especially in the fields of security. And uh, Catherine, in the beginning of our conversation, I think highlighted um, um, totally correctly uh, that um, America is the essential security provider for Europe still. And the moment it lacks the capacity, the willingness to do this, and we had some signs under the Trump administration that it, it might like at least the willingness to do this, uh, it will be quite difficult really by, for the Europeans to fill this gap and uh, to take it uh, their security in their own hands. Uh, certainly not in the next 24 or 36 months, even not beyond that. And, and this is certainly the, the biggest worry we have. We all know how uh, polarized um, American politics has become in the past years. Uh, how much it limits the room of maneuver for American president uh, internationally, uh, and that we might perhaps end up with a Trump two administration at the end, uh, which will I think will by far more difficult to take for the Europeans than the Trump one administration. I, I don't want to downplay um, the the crisis of of democratic institutions and practices that we're seeing not just here in the US, um, but in in other parts of the world as well. Um, It is obviously a a point of concern, but it sort of this conversation that we're having leads to to my closing question to each of you, which is, you know, we're we're seeing some growing distance between Germany and the US. Um, Catherine, I'm sure this was the case for you um, with the election of Donald Trump. And since then, I was constantly getting the question, Um, How reliable a partner is the United States? Um, More recently, we have seen um, a lot of press coverage, opinion pieces, journalists um, asking the same question about Germany. How reliable a partner is Germany in light of the differences of opinion over how to respond to Russia in Ukraine? And so we seem to be also in a relationship crisis. Um, This is a crisis that I think all of us as transatlanticists would agree has been taken for granted for for far too long, but it's a relationship that needs to be worked on. It needs to be maintained. Um, And so as we start to wrap up and and think about sort of the closing timeline um, that Olaf Scholz and Joe Biden have before the midterms and, and hopefully in the second two years of this first term of of Biden in office, um, how reliable and how vibrant a partnership do you think we can have? 
Well, if that's not the question right now, Steve, I don't know what is. Um, you know, my answer to that has got to be always take the call. If the president of the United States offers a call and you're the chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, I don't know, again, if this reporting is entirely accurate, but uh, we heard earlier in the week that the chancellor may or may not have declined uh, a possibility of a conversation with the American president. Always take the call, stand your ground if you have one, explain clearly to the other side what you feel is needed, what your, I mean, nobody understands that better than Americans is what your limitations are in the public diplomacy field. I think that's part of the issue at stake here, again, which is part of, which was part of the genius of Blinken's speech had more people heard it, um, which is something that the Americans have done for a long time is try to advocate uh, for the public policy of the other side. Um, look, we, we have, I mean, I would wish that um, the citizenry here um, of my native country woke up more to a fuller understanding of what this threat perception actually means. I'm frankly surprised being back here uh, with Russia so close. And again, you keep pointing out that we are in Berlin. Stefan and I could get into a car and mainline it out to, to Moscow uh, in, a, in a number of hours, quote unquote, long hours, but nonetheless. Um, I'm actually surprised at a lack of understanding of, and maybe that's because Crimea uh, felt like an sort of a, a, a an international law inconvenience, um, but not it didn't for all the morality it didn't you know this whole annexation uh, didn't bring up enough of that German historical memory uh, for it to be vivid enough. We need it. Uh, we need that constant conversation. Um, we need it. I mean, I'm, I'm one who will always say we need it on every level because clearly, as you're pointing out, we're not sufficiently understanding one another. And that's why, you know, the work of the ACG, the Atlantic work of the GMF and the both of our think tanks here has become all the more vital. Um, so which is to say, I don't have a good solution, um, but we have to keep talking. We have to take each other's phone calls because time is ticking. What we're dealing with is of utmost danger to our societies and our economies and ultimately our people. And if we don't get it right, the effects are cataclysmic. Yeah, I, I, I think I can only underline this. We have to, we need this conversation. I think we have to be more frank in this conversation. We have to talk about also our divergencies. So we usually emphasize as a mantra, our shared interests and values. I think we have to talk a little bit more about where our interests diverge from each other. Uh, Catherine already um, uh, addressed the issue of divergent threat perceptions. Uh, when you ask Germans what the major threats are we have confronted with, they, I think, are partly different from the American uh, threat uh, perception. And we have to address this divergence a bit more and be more frank about that. So I think this is, from my point of view, the first condition to have really them solution, common ground on, on certain issues. Well, Catherine and Stefan, I know it's been a very busy day for both of you. Um, and I want to thank you both for ending your day uh, with this very lively conversation. Uh, it has been interesting and incredibly informative. Um, and I hope we have an opportunity to engage again in the not too distant future. But until then, uh, stay well. And thank you again for, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Steve. Thank you for the work you. that you do. It's vital in this day and age. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Bye-bye.